Hello, everybody. Sorry, give us one minute and we're gonna get ready to get started. Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm just gonna give it a second to allow folks to come in, uh, but welcome everyone. My name is Kim Baral, and I am one of the co-founders of the Rooted Recipes Project. Um, though we are gathering here um, in this virtual space from different parts of the country and different parts of the world tonight, um, many of us are joining from the San Francisco Bay Area and specifically the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center is located on the land of the Ramatush Ohlone people. Um, so we want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. And as guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. Uh, we wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Tui to talk a little bit about tonight's event. Thank you so much, Kim. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Tui, and I'm the co-founder of Rooted Recipes. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. This is Forging Our Futures, our culinary love letter to San Francisco Chinatown. The pandemic and anti-Asian violence has left our communities devastated. Rooted Recipes aims to re-envision how we can hold space for our collective grief and make room for our joys during this pivotal moment. It is an honor to have this opportunity to spotlight our beloved Chinatown and the people who make it what it is through historical ties, living memories, recipes, and everything in between. This neighborhood and layered history has served the Chinese Exclusion Act, earthquakes, fires, the bubonic plague, COVID, racism, and it will continue to survive and even thrive with our help. The stories tonight speak of the resiliency, resourcefulness, and power of our people. Whether you still live there, have moved away or only visited a few times, you can still help keep Chinatown alive. As you show our storytellers some love tonight, I encourage you to also reflect on your own relationship to this neighborhood and other Chinatowns to make room for all the complexities that arise. Growing up on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, my Vietnamese refugee family would drive one hour to Boston Chinatown nearly every Sunday for dim sum and pho, Asian produce and nail salon supplies, and to feel closeness to something achingly familiar. When my parents finally visited me in SF, I took them to Chinatown, tried to convey the reasons I moved to San Francisco, showed them the streets where I would chase down the 30 and 45 buses, the bakeries I waited in line for, told them that this was the first in North America. Because of this Chinatown, our Boston one exists. I'm going to throw it back to Kim to talk about our tech overviews and uh, thank yous. Thanks, Twee. Um, so some of the technical things I want to go over for tonight. Um, first, um, on Zoom, we have captioning, live transcripts, and ASL interpretation available. Um, please show some appreciation in the chat for our two interpreters tonight, Christine and Stephanie. Um, and if you would like to use the live transcripting or um, the subtitles on Zoom, please click the CC live transcript button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we are also live streaming this on Zoom right now. Um, the link is on the slide you're seeing as well as it'll also be um, shared in the chat. So if you want to watch this again later on, or if you know anyone who was not able to register and join us on Zoom, you can share this link with them. 
Um, if you have any questions throughout tonight, whether they are technical questions or any questions for Rooted Recipes or any of our storytellers, please use the Q&A um, within the Zoom and you can find the button for that on the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, but we do encourage you to um, use the chat tonight to engage with everyone, to hype up our storytellers, send them affirmations, and share anything that resonates to you while our storytellers are sharing tonight. And before we introduce our MC, I do wanna um, do some thank yous. So thank you to our community partners, the Chinatown Community Development Center, the Chinese Culture Center of San Francisco, and Lunchbox Moments. All the proceeds from the tickets tonight will be donated um, to them. And then I also wanna thank um, the Chinatown organizations and um, businesses that we got all the gift box goodies from. Um, we, of course, want to thank the Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center um, for hosting this festival, um, and as well as the funders for this year's festival for funding uh, us and all of our festival artists. And lastly, I want to thank all of you for attending tonight and supporting Pacific Islander and Asian American arts. Um, we wanna make sure that the San Francisco Bay Area um, remains a place for Asian Pacific Islander art to thrive. So please, please um, email your district supervisors and tell them why this arts community is important to you um, and why you want them to continue supporting API art. Uh, yes, thank you, APIC, as people are saying in the chat. Um, and now I am going to hand it to Tui to introduce our MC for tonight. I also I also really want to take a moment to um, thank Kim, um, my co-conspirator in this. And Kim, thank you so much for all your work. And honestly, you're the backbone of this entire operation. Um, so without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our host for the evening. Tracy Zhu was born and raised in San Francisco to a Chinese immigrant family from the Taosan area of Southeast Asia. She is both privileged to have been immersed in a Chinese community that practiced their culture and food ways, but also developed resilience through the experience of poverty and the hustle culture. For over 15 years, she has had roles as an environmental justice educator, racial justice strategist, and public servant. Most recently, she serves on the board of Chinese for Affirmative Action. Tracy, it is all you. Thank you so much, Tui. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm so honored to be your guide, your docent, if you will, for this wonderful evening of storytelling about our connections to food and Chinatown. I wish I was gathering with you all like we did in past Rooted Recipes events to share a meal and be in good company. I can picture it now, opening up a dong and discovering the surprise feelings inside. Alas, the next best thing is to gather together to plan for our next meal, whether it's in Chinatown or in Yong Kitchen. Chinatown has such a special place in my heart and it means so many different things to so many different people. It is a gateway or a revolving door for many immigrants like my family. Chinatown is the first place my immigrant parents and my four sisters moved to when they immigrated from Toisan. Chinatown is where they lived in a SRO, a single room occupancy hotel room that is eight feet by 10 feet wide with shared bathrooms and a kitchen before they moved into an apartment and then a house in Bayview. It remains an essential services hub for people like my mom who go every week to do grocery shopping to the bank, and to see the Chinese medicine doctor. As a kid, I would accompany my mom to, um, to do grocery shopping. So if you ever see an eight-year-old alone outside of a produce market, you can bet that she, like me, gave up Sunday cartoons to guard the granny cart while her mom was shopping inside. It is a headquarters for Chinese American civil rights movement. It's an economic center to build intergenerational wealth. Most importantly, it is a cultural hub for the entire Bay Area region. And I will guarantee you that anyone with a memory of Chinatown will recall their memories of the food. We're so thrilled that you joined us today for a little nostalgia to learn about new ways to connect with Chinatown and to talk story with our wonderful lineup of storytellers. 
throughout the night, feel free to show your love for the speakers in the chat. Like Kim said, our lovely chat moderator will be sharing links, Instagram handles, and questions. We encourage you to click, follow, and share your own thoughts. Our first question is, what brings you to Chinatown? For me, other than grocery shopping, another reason why I keep going back to Chinatown are the programs hosted by two community organizations, Chinatown, De Development, Commu Chinatown, Development, Chinatown Community Development Center, CCDC, and Chinese Culture Center. Today's event supports these two organizations in Chinatown. Did you know that Chinatown has more than 40 alleyways and one is called Salted Fish Alleyway? Well, I learned that from CCDC's youth-led tours, the Chinatown Alleyway Tours, who highlights social justice history of the neighborhood and leads visitors down back alleyways used by locals. And the art exhibits that are hosted by Chinese Culture Center are worth the trip to Chinatown, where they take appointments and walk-ins. We really thank these two organizations for decades of investments in the neighborhood. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Shirley Huey and of the Lunchbox Moments. They're one of our community partners for this event. Shirley is one of the co-curators and editors of Lunchbox Moments Zine. Born and raised in San Francisco, she's a freelance writer, grant writer, and consultant. She writes about identity, place, and culture through a food lens. We're lucky to be featuring three writers from Lunchbox Moments, who, will be, who you will be hearing from throughout the evening. Shirley, take it away. Thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. Thanks to Twee and Kim of Rooted Recipes Project for organizing this awesome event and APIC and everyone involved in making this event happen. My name is Shirley and I'm one of the co-curators together with Diane Leo Omine and Anthony Shu of Lunchbox Moments, a zine featuring Asian American writers and artists reflecting on cultural identity and food. My personal connection to Chinatown, by the way, is deep. This is where I was born, at Chinese Hospital, a place that was created by the Chinese community who were denied full access to healthcare in the hospitals reserved for the non-Chinese. And happier memories with my grandmother and the rest of my family, I remember shopping for groceries and produce, picking up cha siu or fruit and cream filled birthday cakes at the bakeries, going to yum cha on weekends, seeing movies at Daiming Sing, the Great Star Theater, which I hear now is going to be up and running again soon. The zine features the work of 30 intergenerational writers and artists and all proceeds from the sale go to CCDC and their work to support San Francisco Chinatown restaurants and the people who live and work there. You can find it at shop dot lunchboxmoments.com. It is on sale now. My co-curators and I were moved, like many of us here, seeing what was happening in our communities, Chinatowns across the United States, and especially in San Francisco, where Diane and I both grew up. We saw the violence and the discrimination, the scapegoating of Asian Americans for all things related to the pandemic. We were moved to do something to lift up our community voices and to raise money for Chinatown and the communities we care about. Uh, a lunchbox moment is a term used to describe an experience that a lot of Asian Americans have with feeling othered for their food. For many, this happens in school. For some, this happens later at work or in a different context. And for others, they may not experience at all. We wanted to showcase the many voices and ways in which people may experience a lunchbox moment or not. Uh, so without further ado, our first reader is Vivian Shin. Vivian currently works in healthcare and she is interested in topics regarding identity and narrative medicine. You know, I actually don't think we have Vivian right now, so we're going to bring it back to Tracy to introduce um, Tamiko. Thank you, Twee. 
we're going to just um, bring up Tamiko, one of our lunchbox speakers. Um, and as Tamiko's getting ready, I'm going to do a quick uh, introduction of Tamiko. So we're really excited to have um, Tamiko. Um, Tamiko was born and raised in San Francisco with roots in Japantown, Chinatown, and the Richmond District. Her work has been included in Standing Strong, Fillmore, sorry, Standing Strong, Fillmore, and Japantown Anthology. Uh, she's been featured on Pacific Time and in Asian Week. She writes poetry, memoir, and song. Tamiko has also produced podcasts and zines. So we're excited to have our first Lunchbox Moment contributor, Tamiko, join us. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate it. And I really feel honored to be part of this lovely group of people who will be sharing their stories. And I want to say that um, it's really wonderful also to be part of APEX United States of Asian American Festival. Um, you know, I've admired this festival for a long time and to be able to share something here is really an honor. Um, let's see, I have many fond memories of visiting Chinatown with my yeah, yeah, who would do Tai Chi in St. Mary Square, and then take me to Dim Sum at Louis on Grant, sometimes to um, uh, Golden Dragon, but that was usually reserved for the times when his friends from D Tai Chi would join us. And I still crave uh, Louis chicken rice and some people I've talked to actually still remember that too. So if anybody has the recipe out there, I'd love to um, have that. Um, let's see, I also have many fond memories of visiting Chinatown because my grandmother, uh, my Yang Yang was really fond of Chinese movies. And so I remember, you know, very, very vividly in many of those theaters that are unfortunately no longer, many of them are no longer um, still open in Chinatown, but that's, you know, another reason why I, definitely do not take what we have in Chinatown for granted because it has changed over time. I've also had the pleasure of working in Chinatown for over 10 years and um, at the Chinese Culture Center, at the Chinese Historical Society, and also in Oakland at the Oakland Asian Cultural Center. So I've had hundreds of meals in Chinatown, tea time, snacks, meetings with friends. I've been very, very fortunate. Um, let's see, <laughs> I might joke about the whatever freshman 10 or whatever you call that every time i worked in a chinatown i've mostly gained weight although the the the, the um hills also have helped me to stay in shape as well but anyways that's a different story so one of my favorite dishes is what's showing here it's hong kong style shrimp and eggs over rice and it's from washington bakery and i love this dish and um crave it still and and i'm very happy that they still have it even though it's not i don't think on officially on their menu so I could give a whole talk about my favorite foods from Chinatown, but I'm going to be sharing a story about my father who passed away a few years ago, and I think of him every day and miss him very much. I feel lucky that I grew up in San Francisco and that my parents chose to send me to schools where diversity was the norm. I attended Neil Machi Little Friends Preschool in Japantown, where I sang songs in Japanese and learned to make rice balls. In the Japanese bilingual bicultural program at my public elementary school, most kids were of Japanese heritage and some were born in Japan. At Presidio Middle School in Wash, Chinese children and other kids of Asian descent made up about 50% of our student body, so I was never othered for the food that I brought for school lunch. In elementary school, I instead envied the tasty looking bentos brought by kids with moms from Japan. In high school, I learned from friends in the know about salted fish and chicken fried rice and Hong Kong style shrimp and eggs over rice when we would cut class <laughs> to have a sit down lunch off campus. However, my food life at home was another story. My American born Chinese father was not a fan of Japanese food. For him, it was teriyaki, not teriyaki. And rice was just too, the rice was just too sticky for him. So I learned to make Japanese short grain rice on the stove at a very young age, since the rice cooker was always preparing my father's preferred Texas long grain. My dad would say, they play too much with their food and it looks nice, but there's never enough. His Chinese American sensibilities just would not embrace the food from my mother's side of my family. If I go to Japan, he'd say, I will ask for hambuga. That's the word for hamburger. And he'd laugh and he'd have a twinkle in his eye. And it was kind of funny, but I was kind of, it was a funny joke, but anyways. And yet when we finally took a trip to Japan, he was an ever gracious guest trying everything, the setos, the shiroshitas, the okadas had laid out for us, whether it was shabu shabu, kushiyaku, kushiyaki, which he called stick food, and even sashimi. 
After that trip, my dad started joining my mom and me for meals at Japanese restaurants and learned to make shabu shabu at home. Quite to my surprise, for most of the last years of his life, Japanese short grain rice filled my parents' cooker about half of the time. He taught me that an old dog could learn new tricks and I no longer felt othered. Thank you. Thank you so much to Miko for your story of um, evolving relationships with food. I can say it's probably a lifelong uh, relationship with food that's going to continue to evolve. Well, our next guest, I recently saw an NBC article that popped up in my Facebook feed because, you know, Facebook algorithm predicted that we would be at the same event together. The speaker, Miss Dorothy Kwok, was born in 1934 to immigrant parents in San Francisco's Chinatown. She was one of eight children growing up during the Great Depression. Today, Miss Dorothy still lives in Chinatown where she leads tours through WalkWiz. So if you wanna learn more about Chinatown through a local's eyes, sign up with WalkWiz. She was a researcher for a local filmmaker, um, James Q. Chan's documentary, Forever Chinatown, which if you haven't seen, it is a must-see documentary. It's about James's miniature recreation, recreations of Chinatown places. You can see the documentary on canopy.com, which you can access for free with your public library card. Ms. Dorothy is often featured on the Instagram account Chinatown Pretty for her unique and inventive style. Over to you, Ms. Dorothy. Over to you, Dorothy. Thank you. I'm privileged to be a part of this marvelous program. Because I am a tour guide for the company in this neighborhood, Walk With Chinatown Tours, I can recall some childhood memories. I think some of you older folks may remember one of the oldest restaurants, Sam Wall on Washington Street near Grant Avenue. Our family of eight at that time going on nine, during the Great Depression of the 1930s, lived around the corner of Samoa restaurant at Waverly Place in a single room occupancy, SRO, we would call it. My number one late sister who was almost 10 years my senior, told me that about 2 a.m. when Samoa closes, she and my father would take the biggest pots and get free leftovers. Juk, the rice porridge, which Samoa is known for, the noodles, whatever did not sell that day and bring it back so that we would all have something to eat at breakfast. Whenever I passed by now where Sam Wall was, I feel grateful to the res generous restaurant owners because we never starved during the Great Depression. The restaurant has moved, as some of you may know. It is now located at 713 Clay Street, near Kearney, across from Portsmouth Square Park. Thank you everyone for making giving this opportunity for me to be part of your program. Thank you, Miss Dorothy. Did you wanna say a few words about your um, steamed egg recipe? The recipe that you shared with us from before? I shared it mostly because it's simple inexpensive, especially for some of you who are in tight budgets. Uh, it's um, a meager, but certainly can be added to other dishes. 
and not difficult to make. Um, the directions I see is post-it. And uh, I think it was Kim that, that actually made it. And so there's a photo of how it could look. If there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer. Can you share with us um, your tip about how not to have um, like bubbles in the egg? Oh, yeah, that's something that I learned in subsequent years. To use water that has been boiled and cool and only really put in half a cup at a time and keep beating the eggs. First, at the beginning, the instructions I gave is to, to beat it thoroughly and then add half a cup at a time. Each egg should have half a cup. So if you have six eggs, you have three cups total. Thank you and so much, Dorothy. You're welcome. And, and I know you can't see the chat box, but I just want you to know that a lot of people are really, they say that they really love steamed egg. Even though it is a simple dish, it's a really comforting dish for a lot of people. Yes, inexpensive and also comfort food, I call it. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Miss Dorothy. Uh, I'll, I'll say that amongst the audience members, one of those is my older sister who said that our mom makes, uh, makes it for our nephews and nieces all the time. And it's definitely a comfort food that is being passed down to the generations. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing with us your recipe. Next up, um, going to bring up our next speaker, uh, June May. June May is one of our lunchbox storytellers. This is a timely story about Jung, which you can see here my mother is making at this moment, actually. It's a food that is made for the Dragon Boat Festival, which is coming up next week. It's a wonderful food that families make at home during the holiday. You may find it in only a few places in Chinatown, so you should go now because it's a holiday food. Um, so eat all you can eat now. June May is an emerging writer and washed up neo poet, sorry, washed up neo pets omelet chef living in Boston on Wampanoag land. He descended from the Cygnus constellation in a shower of jacaranda petals 6,000 years ago. His work is forthcoming in Queer Asian Project and the Untold Narratives. I want to turn it over to Jun May. Thank you, Tracy, for that introduction. Um, just wanted to just share a quick thank you to the amazing Rooted Recipes Project team, our amazing ASL interpreters, Lunchbox Moments, other community partners, my fellow storytellers, and all attendees here tonight. I'll be reading my piece that's featured in Lunchbox Moment Scene, available for pre-order today. All right. Zhongzi, or Zhong, as my family calls it in Cantonese, is a traditional Chinese dish composed of glutinous rice and various fillings. Wrapped in bamboo or other leaves, Zhong can be sweet or savory, and many regions have their own variations. I grew up eating the Guangdong-style Zhong, filled with mung beans, peanuts, pork belly, and salted duck egg yolk. I especially loved the egg yolk for its rich flavor and vibrant color. Zhong was one of my favorite meals growing up, ranking right below century eggs and pork kanji, peidan sayu Growing up, my sister and I ate the school lunch. Our parents worked full time and didn't have the luxury of preparing home cooked lunches every day. It was a treat whenever we got to bring Zhong or something else for lunch, a respite from soggy milk cartons and flat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. 
without much funding. Our school didn't have a big cafeteria or, <clears throat> excuse me, or microwaves for students to use. So when we brought Zhong to school, our mom would steam them, would steam them in the morning, unwrap the leaves, and place them in thermal lunch boxes so they'd still be warm at lunchtime. One day in ninth grade, I grabbed a seat with some classmates at one of the tables in the lunchroom, which also doubled as our school's gym and auditorium. I opened my lunchbox, ready to snack on some zhong. Almost immediately, I heard, whoa, what is that? Oh my god, are you like eating dog? Smells kind of weird. My face felt uncomfortably warm. I muttered some weak comeback to the rest of the table and focused on fiercely shoveling Zhong into my mouth. At that moment, all I wanted to do was bury myself miles beneath the school to get away from how embarrassed I felt. I imagined embracing my new life as a Zhong eating mole person. My thoughts ran wild. They're just kidding around. Don't be so uptight. Maybe Zhong does look weird, unwrapped and uneaten. Has Zhong smelled weird all this time? Do I smell like Zhong? Do people think I smell? These feelings of shame and difference persist, but I've been to enough therapy sessions. I've seen how a soupy yet somehow bone dry green bean casserole passes as familiar while steamed egg like the one Miss Dorothy makes, rice noodles, and black sesame soup are considered exotic. I refuse to let that nonsense bother me anymore. As a queer person of color, my life is colored with microaggressions and beige nonsense. But the thick skin I have today was nowhere to be found as a pimply-faced, jong-loving teenager. At that moment, being othered as a weird Asian who ate smelly food at a predominantly white school was a slap to the face, a reminder of how I stood outside the norm. While I was ashamed to be othered that one time at lunch, I'm even more distressed that I let people's words get to me. I let someone who considered chicken salad the only acceptable lunch option affect me. That idea is wild to me now. Zhong is amazing. Zhong is delicious. Zhong is an edible labor of love. I'm done with shame, except for um, Evelyn Champagne King's 1977 hit single, Shame. Great song. Bring on pride and indifference. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get a head start in wrapping some aggressively mediocre jong in time for the Dragon Boat Festival. Thank you. Thank you so much, Junmei. Oh, your story makes me miss my mom's jong so badly right now, especially the ones with preserved duck eggs. Last but not least, for our, our last lunchbox uh, storyteller, we have Vivian Chen. Vivian currently works in healthcare and is interested in topics regarding identity and narrative medicine. Vivian, you're up. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here tonight and I really appreciate your patience with me. Um, I'll be sharing a short piece I've called The Customer. Um, and this, I wrote this past year when dealing with um, some personal feelings about the year and about my work. What they didn't tell me about working in medicine is that sometimes it feels like the golden rule of the service industry applies here too. The patient is always right. So in the still early days of the virus, when I began wearing masks in the hospital, masks that couldn't hide the shape of my eyelids, I started to enter patient rooms with a hesitancy unrelated to any clinical difficulties. Hey, you know why China always has these diseases? It's because they eat bats. 
I'm sure you know all about that. A patient tells me this with the confidence that reminds me of those teenagers I've seen who roam Chinatown just to gawk and laugh at the butcher stalls with roast duck hanging in the windows. I tell myself my mental energy is better spent thinking about this man's heart failure and not his hurtful comments. So I grip my teeth and press my stethoscope to his chest, then proceed to explain his daily care plan to him in an airy, overly sweet tone of voice. The same voice that I've heard my uncle use with any unpleasant patrons at his restaurant. The customer is always right. My uncle had another smaller restaurant before his current one. But all I can remember is the restaurant as it is now with its decadent tablecloths and decor from his hometown and the large round tables with glass tops because a meal at his restaurant was always an affair where you laugh too loud and stay too long and eat far too much. When I first met my cousins, we all slurped noisily on his specialty soup dumplings. And when I graduated college, my parents and I enjoyed dishes of soft shell crab and a whole steamed fish. There are so many memories that I associate with the flavors and spices of these moments. And before this year, I couldn't imagine his restaurant ever being empty. But suddenly these dishes and an entire culture of people responsible for their creation were now seen as contaminated untrustworthy. The next patient I round on is an elderly woman and I can see from the doorway that she is intently watching the news. And these days, the news is dominated by only one topic. I take a deep breath and move forward with the pleasantries and my exam. She's recovering well and will likely be discharged soon, so my mood improves. I'm ready to leave, but she turns to me intently and asks, where are you from? The pit of dread in my stomach returns, so I put on my airy, unaffected voice and give her the answer that I know she's after. Oh, my family's from China. She gestures towards the television where they are showing heat maps of new cases, and I prepare myself for another comment about eating bats. How awful this virus is, she sighs. Do you still have family living there? I hope that they are doing okay and staying safe. She gently pats me with a wrinkled hand, a hand that reminds me of the grandparents overseas that I haven't seen in years and will not be able to see this year. I struggle with finding words for a moment. Thank you. Sometimes the patient is all right. Thank you, thank you so much, Vivian, for sharing your story as a frontline worker, one of the, our many everyday heroes who have gotten us through this global pandemic. Next up, I'm thrilled to introduce you to the owner of one of Chinatown's iconic bakeries and restaurants, Washington Bakery. It's a classic Hong Kong style bakery and restaurant where kids like me would buy my after school snack of bolo bao or pineapple bun or seniors would hang out like it's a senior center while they drink Lai Ta. This place is still around because of Chelsea Hung, a San Francisco native and former Miss Chinatown. Three years ago, she took over her parents' restaurant of 23 years. She strives to give back to her community and wants to encourage the next generation to also support and preserve our historic Chinatown. Chelsea, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, I'm Chelsea. I made a little video about the restaurant and about Chinatown and um, the restaurant's experience during the pandemic. Thank you guys for watching. Hi, I'm Chelsea Hung. I was born and raised in San Francisco. My mom is from Hong Kong and since she was young, she knew one day she wanted to open up a small bakery cafe since her dad had a restaurant back in Hong Kong. During that time, there weren't that many Hong Kong style cafes. Fast forward to 1995, my parents opened up Washington Bakery and Restaurant and my dad and uncles built it from the ground up. My immigrant parents have been in the restaurant industry for over 30 years. I grew up in their restaurants. I've worked there since I was young. Some of the OG employees that have worked there for 10 to 20 years practically raised me. I ate there all the time. A few generations of my family's milestones were celebrated there and so much sacrifice and struggle went into building the business. 
little over three years ago, my mom was getting more and more exhausted and wanted to retire and sell the restaurant. When she told me, I thought she should retire, but I also felt sad thinking about not having this meaningful place anymore. I wasn't ready to let go of our second home yet. I saw so much history and so many more new memories and opportunities to be made. I saw how much my family sacrificed to build this, and I wanted to honor them by continuing their legacy. I was living in New York at the time, and I left my job and packed my bags and moved back to San Francisco to start this crazy journey. I sacrificed my comfortable lifestyle and 9-5 to five tech job to work crazy hours every day for the restaurant. It's like I came full circle from working at tech companies that help entrepreneurs to being an entrepreneur myself. Having grown up in Chinatown, we've seen many businesses close down here, and it just isn't as lively as it used to be. I realize it's up to our generation to pay it forward and continue the charm and grace in the community that we grew up in. Owning a restaurant is very strenuous. I knew it would be difficult, but I could not have anticipated how challenging it really is. Through this, I've garnered even more respect and gratitude to my parents for enduring for so long. Then COVID happened. As if things weren't challenging enough already, but it gave us more opportunities to help the community. Since we've opened, along with providing delicious comfort Hong Kong style food, we've always been a community driven restaurant and help our community however we can from donating to local community events and charities to advocating for small businesses in Chinatown. Our restaurant and many other businesses in Chinatown are linked in a unique commercial ecosystem that helps make Chinatown a complete neighborhood. We purchase from many local vendors, we employ residents in the community, we serve many local residents, and we give back to the community. Though COVID really took a negative hit on us to the point I thought we would have to make the difficult decision to close permanently. It was such a time of uncertainty and really just making tough decisions day by day from laying off our team to figuring out, figuring out how we are going to survive through a worldwide shutdown. Chinatown restaurants and businesses were one of the first in the city to be impacted and have suffered significant decline in business since January 2020 due to the combination of rising xenophobia along with shelter in place orders, especially since many businesses in Chinatown rely on tourism. We had to adapt to all the changes and restrictions, which comes at a cost. If we wanted to survive as a restaurant during the pandemic, we had to be innovative and find other opportunities where we could grow in when dining and company catering wasn't an option anymore. We innovated by providing contactless options, more delivery options, and outdoor dining. We created different meal kits for people to make some of our dishes at home, such as our variety of noodle soup meal kits and our baked rice and spaghetti trays that you can bake at home. We knew that food insecurity is a huge issue, especially during the pandemic, and we were fortunate to find opportunities to grow in and continue to help our community, such as our partnerships with different meal programs that help restaurants rehire their teams and stay open while providing meals for people with food insecurities. We prep, package, and deliver seven days of breakfast, lunch, and dinner to seniors with food insecurities each week through a program called a SEPNI deal. So our, more, our most vulnerable population during the pandemic doesn't have to worry about how they will get their next meal. We're also a part of another meal program called Feed and Fuel which provides an opportunity for us to pass out meals to Chinatown residents living in SRO, single room occupancy. This program feeds over 3,000 Chinatown SRO residents. Residents living in SROs usually live in a very small space with communal kitchens, which makes it difficult during the pandemic to social distance. Many of these residents also became unemployed during the start of the pandemic. In a survey conducted last year by Chinatown Community, Development Center, about 43% indicated that they were restaurant workers and 77% said they had become unemployed during the pandemic. The local essential businesses along Stockton are doing better. However, the businesses on Grant Street that depend on tourism were doing the worst and many stores are closed. This means that the anchor of Chinatown's sustainability still lies with its residents and stakeholders and citywide Chinese Americans and businesses that serve them. This is where our resilience lies. With the pandemic, anti-Asian violence, and all these negative things that are happening everywhere, the simplest thing you can do to help is to be kind to one another because everyone is going through their own challenges and struggles. You can see how to support us and or help others with food insecurities. Please continue to support your local small businesses and communities. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Chelsea. Oh my gosh, what an institution. 
Oh my gosh. I think we all just need to take a breath and a moment to appreciate institutions like Washington Bakery. It is really a pl places like Washington Bakery that give our neighborhoods character, give us a reason to walk up that Washington Street Hill. And it's businesses like hers that keep our streets safe by having eyes and ears open. I just want to take a moment because the chat is blowing up y'all like y'all are some of the best audiences for a zoom gathering so i just want to read out some of the answers to um our prompt earlier uh what's your favorite chinatown pastry and i'm obviously very biased towards you know what you see behind me but people reminded me that not only are egg tarts fantastic, but potat are um, even better because it's the creme brulee version of egg tarts. <laughs> so um, that's pretty amazing. Someone said coconut tart is one of their favorites. This is a really great memory. I remember drinking coffee for the first time at Washington Bakery with my mom. That's pretty cool. Um, other things, the bo dai fan at uh, Washington Bakery. The question really should have been, what's your favorite dish at Washington Bakery? <laughs> That's really what the question should have been. So um, lots and lots of love for um, our local hero, uh, Chelsea, uh, including thank you for taking care of the needy. What great food programs. Wow, for real, be kind and support local business. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, wait, this is extra impressive. I believe Chelsea started uh, gift cards at Washington Bakery. So that's pretty impressive for a Chinese restaurant. Um, shout outs to CCDC for uh, gathering businesses like Washington Bakery to participate in feeding uh, uh, homebound seniors, people who live in SROs, people who are needy. Um, okay, it just keeps going. So I'm gonna, at some point gonna have to <laughs> switch over, but take a moment and uh, reflect on this question. Something that I think a lot of us have been thinking about. How are we all fostering recovery, resilience, and regeneration in Chinatown communities during these difficult times? Take a moment, you can even jot a note down for yourself um, and really just reflect because it takes all of us to really keep um, our neighborhoods thriving. Uh, it takes our foot traffic, it takes sharing things on social media, it takes um, putting in Yelp reviews in English for our monolingual businesses. So please, please, please um, support our businesses. Next up, uh, we have Leland Wong. Leland Wong is also born and raised in the heart of San Francisco Chinatown. He is an artist, photographer, and dumpling master. His artistic focus is on his community, the streets, the cafes, and the people that have shaped his life and artwork. He created and manages the Facebook group we grew up in San Francisco Chinatown. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Leland. Hey, am I coming across loud and clear? Yes. Just, okay. Great, uh, yeah, I'm Leland Wong. I'm born and raised in Chinatown. Uh, like many, we were born in the Chinese hospital. Um, my, my family had a, my, my parents had a, Curio shop, uh, two doors away up from the Far East Cafe, and that's where I grew up, and that's where we lived as well. So, uh, yeah, and and, and uh, you know, all fond memories of food in Chinatown. Uh, I, you know, there, there, my mother, you know, picked me us up uh, from school at lunchtime to 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 just you know go to a restaurant such as Uncle's, uh, which is on it used to be on Waverly and. Uh, Clay and you know and uh, and Fong Fong you know which is used to be on Stockton Street that had well what I'm really getting at in here now is there we ate American food at these restaurants okay Fong Fong had hamburgers uncles had uh, uh, you know um, <laughs> American food let's say that uh, and then um, and uh, so so there's a whole culture of uh, American food restaurants in Chinatown, and I often wonder too, you know, why now? Why is that? And I can really answer that, but I can just kind of put the pieces together, I guess. And uh, no, uh, it's uh, Chinatown had has a real bachelor's had a real bachelor society uh, due to 
you know, exclusion and, uh, and, and, you know, just, just, just their, you know, just doing uh, uh, their jobs, uh, their low paying jobs, they, you know, they, they, they never, uh, and they, they lived in, S, in the SROs, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of these restaurants, I mean, they're not, they, they, like I say, there used to be many restaurants like that in Chinatown uh, that served American food and, and, and catered mostly to the sing, these single men living in the SROs. And um, all I can say is that that was their biggest square meal for the day, you know? A lot of these restaurants uh, uh, had soup, uh, and in the, and in the main course, you know, and, and I say it's it's American food. It it, it, it could be a, a prime rib. It could be it could be a, a roast pork with curry gravy. It could be you know veal cutlet. It could be it could be salmon. You know what have you? Uh, and uh, like I say, th this is their their the square meal for the day. I mean, I mean, I, I would assume you know the 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 breakfast and the lunch and all that was, was a lot smaller. Uh, and, 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 and these restaurants also served as coffee shops for, for these men too. They, 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 they would get together with their friends and, uh, and, and, and have coffee. And, and there used to be a, a, a real pie culture in Chinatown as well. Uh, uh, you know, there was, you could get, easily get apple pie, custard pie, you know, and what have you. And, and there was this one restaurant named Sunwa Q. Uh, used to be uh, right on Washington, right by Ross Alley, and uh, they they won a uh, state competition that to claim the fame with the apple pie. So uh, like I say there was a real pie culture as well. You know, like like, like these uh, American restaurants were like you know like like, like little hangouts for, for for a lot of these men, uh, uh, you know, to get together with their friends and what have you for coffee. So um, fast forward to our present day. Uh, uh, yeah, there, there's uh, only a few of these kind of restaurants left. I mean, the, 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 the Spatula Society has mostly moved on. And, uh, you know, uh, but, but then again, it's kind of weird too, because when you go to these restaurants, you know, uh, you 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 you'd see mostly men <laughs> and a lot of people eating by themselves as well. So this still has that a uh, vibe to it, you know. And uh, okay, and then um, and then let's get into you know my my my, my favorite one is right now is Pork Chop House. Uh, actually, it's called New Lunting, and it's right on Jackson Street, right by Beckett Alley, and. Uh, to me, they're, they're the last gritty, uh, uh, you know, kind of like American restaurant, uh, a restaurant that serves American food that's still there. You know, I mean, it's, it's hanging on by a thread, but you know, it's it's still there. And I'm and I try to support as much as I can. And and, and you know, first time I went there was like uh, in the late '60s when it was like a dollar fifty per for dinner, and then. Uh, <laughs> Nowadays it's like twelve dollars, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, uh, I, you know, uh, you know, I have a group called We Grew Up in Chinatown. You know, it's great. You know, we we all connect. We all connect. I, I I try to get people to be proud of what they went through growing up as well and talking about it. You know, and uh, and uh, you know, just keeping you know, because I, I feel we had. It. We grew up in a time that was uh, really unique. I mean, it, it cannot be reproduced now. You know, there are people growing up. There are kids growing up in China, but it's not the same. You know, it. We 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 all went to the same school. You know, I mean, we saw saw each other on the street. You know, everyone knew each other. That's what it is. Uh, so, um, so yeah. You know, uh, hopefully, you know we. We'll, you know, th th this will kind of uh, survive. You know, the uh, you know pork chop house will survive the, and all that. Um, what else? Uh, you know, my, so so uh, what, what's my my favorite uh, at pork chop house? Um, lamb curry, uh, 
roast pork with curry gravy. I'm, I'm in the curry, I guess. And uh, I say, and 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 I try to support them as much as possible. Our we group in Chinatown group, you know, have gatherings there, uh, and uh, you know, we try to keep it going. And uh, what is, uh, so other than that, uh, you know, okay, Tweet wanted me to mention that I I do dumplings as well. I mean, I'm really into this uh, food stuff. Uh, my, my parents were as well, so you know, it kind of rubs off on of me. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a dumpling. I call myself a dumpling chef. Uh, I, I, I headed a team that the We Grew Up in Chinatown team to participate in Korean Street Workshops uh, Dumpling Wars, and we won twice. <laughs> and the third time they said, "Sit out." So we did that. Uh, actually, that's a compliment, but uh. Yeah, so, um, and I, and to this, actually that was seven years ago, uh, the, the dumpling wars. So, uh, and, and you know, I've, I've done a lot of other things with my dumplings as well. I, 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 I do little seminars and all that, and dumpling making sessions and all that. I mean, I, I, I was the feature dumpling chef in, uh, in this uh, food event uh, in New York. That was, that was cool too. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, okay. Uh, I feel yeah. Anything else? I, I think that was great, Leland. Oh my gosh! Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. Hey, yeah. I don't know if you saw the comments, but the comments are really blowing up, and and people are really reminiscing like all the classic places to eat at in Chinatown and. Claudia said that she lost to your team and won the dumpling wars. <laughs> yeah, you know, what team was she? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Claudia, what team were you? <laughs> Wait, let's see if we can bring up Claudia. This is, sorry, this is a little impromptu, everyone. It must have been better part tomorrow or something like that. Oh, no, we were the last place team. We were the Rebel Dumpling Alliance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, to, 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 uh, for a while, you know, Cream Sheet Workshop was do, doing it, um, trying to do it every year, but uh, I don't think they made a lot of money. I mean, because of course it was a fundraiser for them as well. I don't think they made a lot of money from it. And yeah, they haven't done it for like seven years now, but it was fun, really. It, it was, and it, and and, uh, and for me, you know, winning the, 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 the competition, you know, propelled me into this foodie world. And Tomiko, <laughs> put the crown on me right on uh, at, at that last one <laughs> okay awesome thank, thank you. you so much Leland mm -hmm. thank you so much Leland well there are two takeaways from his talk which is one we're all going to meet up at New Lunting and then two y'all going to learn how to make dumplings uh, so that you can join the next dumpling wars and um, if you need some recipes, uh, Lisa Lin, our last speaker, will be able to give you some uh, recipes, but uh, we'll get to her later. Um, so in the meantime, thank you. Thank you again, Lee Lin, for your stories. Um, now I want to uh, take you on a short mental tour of Chinatown to connect the dots of some of these places. So first, we're going to start at New Lun Ting, or the Pork Chop House on Jackson Street. Then we're going to cross the street to the Salted Fish Alleyway I mentioned earlier, or Ham Yu Gai, also known as Wentworth Street on Google Maps. You're going to walk past the barbershop, past the family association halls where you hear elders talking really loudly, and you'll end up at Washington Bakery, where you'll pick up a follow bao. Then you're going to turn left down Washington Street, and right on Kearney, on, where you can see the Hilton Hotel. Located inside is the Chinese Culture Center of San Francisco. They're one of our partners and beneficiaries of tonight's event. So we're gonna welcome next YY Zhu, who will tell us a little bit more about Chinese Culture Center. Hi everyone, I'm YY. I'm the exhibition manager at the Chinese Cultural Center of San Francisco. We're so proud to be a community partner of the Forging Our Future with Rooted Recipes Project and Asian Pacific Islander Cultural Center. Chinese Cultural Center, AKA CCC, 
It's a contemporary arts and cultural nonprofit located in SF Chinatown with a mission to elevate the underserved and give voice to equality. CCC has a long history of presenting bold art with social trans transformation and community impact. We support emerging artists as well as marginalized voices through year round exhibitions and cultural programming. We're also so thrilled to have our design store artist unique pins featured in the gift box, as well as our alive and present cultural belonging in SF Chinatown and Manila Town comic, created by amazing artist Christine Wang Yap with story contributors in collaboration with Chinese Cultural Center and Chinatown Arts, Arts and Cultural Coalition. Our CCC design store is an artist and design driven store providing both physical and online platform for emerging artists and designers while supporting CCC's mission to uplift the community. And thank you so much, Leland, for, for sharing your Chinatown story. Um, Leland's art was also featured in our design store back in 2019. And actually, um, New London's pork chop, it's, it's also one of my favorite lunch. I also want to invite you all to our current open exhibitions, now fully reopened. One in our main gallery on 750 Kearney Street, Woman, Woman, From Her to Hair. It's an exhibition that centers Asian queer cultural production, a unique yet often overlooked space between mainstream queer disclosure and Asian American identity. The other one in, in our experimental community space, 41 Ross, located in historical Ross Alley, right next to the iconic Golden Gate Fortune Cookie Factory. And there we currently have a wholesome queer youth made film programming, Screaming 24 seven outdoor in the alleyway, created by Quack Map, Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project, as one of our proud Pride Month programs. And we also have a series programs lined up already and feel free to reach out to me directly in the chat or check out our website and social media and which I will put in the chat box in one second. And coming up, I'm so excited to announce our next storyteller who is also ex exhibited with CCC before, Bijun Liang. Bijun Liang is an interactive media and installation artist from Chinatown, San Francisco. Bijun reimagines the everyday to re recognize the hidden wow moments that are often ignored or forgotten. Bijun. Hello, I will share my screen. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Bijun Liang. I've been in Chinatown for over 20 years now, moved here with my immigrant family, grew up in an SRO, lived and worked here since I was five years old. I am currently a community artist in Chinatown with the CCC, as well as a local resident. Oops. I also really like boba. And that's why for the next five minutes, I'll be doing a walking tour of my neighborhood, walking from my home to where my mom's salon is. And along the journey, I'll be sharing some boba spots with you all while talking about my history with Chinatown and the interesting local highlights along the way. Uh, it's gonna be like a Where's Waldo, but with Bajun. So very first up is quickly a really OG chain when it comes to the migration of boba spots in the neighborhood and it's my personal favorite this is the place that i have gone with friends for over a decade now one of the few that have retained a two dollar fifty price tag on boba which is absolutely crazy in san francisco and i would recommend you order the jasmine milk green with small boba here what i like to highlight is actually the staircase hidden on the right hand side which leads you to a second floor where middle schoolers of my middle school and local Chinatown boys might come to play Pokemon Go or, or something, whatever they do here. 
this is a special spot where I hang out with my friends and it's largely unknown by tourists as far as I know. And it's a great spot to rest your legs and do some people watching at the same time. On the same block as Quickly's across the street is the St. Mary School, which closed down at this point, but it's where I went to elementary and middle school. And if you see the St. Mary's Drum and Bell Corps on the Chinese New Year Parade, this is the birthplace for it. And I was in the, <laughs> in the drill corps for this actually back when I was in school. Next door is the CCC, which is the home base for a lot of my arts practice and what, what I was just talking about. So all my favorite things on the same block together. And the CCC also hosts a number of community events at Portsmouth Square across the street. On the right is a mirror that I got to draw as part of a Black Lives Movement solidarity event hosted by them. And this is where locals and people like my dad like to hang out uh, to play cards and Chinese chess. So if you come by, maybe you'll bump into my dad. That's like a tourist attraction or something, whatever. <laughs> Going one block up from there is another OG boba spot for locals and another one of my favorites also because of the hidden staircase in the back boxed in red which in fact leads you to a second floor once again where locals hang out one of the artists of the ccc called Shi si huang previously did an arts activity here so you might bump into something special every now and then uh, and there's me also in the photo i recommend the avocado smoothie here and it was my go-to for a whole year at one point and Sweetheart Cafe was also a great spot for me just because my mom's salon was two storefronts away. And a story about going between my mom's salon and where I used to live in Chinatown, this boba spot called Kodi Tipar became more important to me back in 2019 because I had to walk between the two places. It was only three blocks, but it was at 10 p.m. And because of the violence that's increased in the area, my mom would be walking home with me together every night for safety reasons. And along the way, this became a mother-daughter boba share time because I would be tempted on that walk every single night. So if you ever pass by this milk tea place, can imagine a mom and a daughter slowly getting fatter night by night. And the roasted milk tea with brass jelly here is my mom's personal favorite. And since then, my mom's salon that I showed previously has actually closed down because of COVID-19, but she moved to another area in Ross Alley where she was also functioning. And you might recognize this place that I'm showing here, which is the Fortune Cookies Factory. But if you ever see them on the news, you might actually catch a glimpse of either my mom or I in the background because we're not the highlight, but we are in the background right there, boxed in red. And here's me and my mom with a boba. I'm getting a haircut. Uh, drop by if you ever pass by. And just to know on the exact same street where both my mom's salon and the Fortune Cookie Factory is, is the 41 Ross Gallery that's hosted by the Chinese Culture Center and the Chinese Community Development Center. Uh, and that's where a lot of the local artists are. One final one, this is, the, this is the Washington Bakery that Chelsea just shared earlier today. And I actually got connected to Chelsea because of the Chinese Culture Center. And I got a chance to draw a mural for the outdoor parklet there. And the funny thing is that most of this was colored in by my dad, my mom, my 70 year old aunt. So if you see this mural here, you can imagine some 50 to 70 year old aunties and uncles in Chinatown who were actually the ones drawing this as part of their Thanksgiving. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Oh my gosh, there's so much going on in this talk. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but thank you so much for taking us on a boba tour. Anybody else taking notes and like marking all these places in your Google Maps? Like, I totally am. Yeah, even though I spent so much time in Chinatown, there's still so much to discover, like these like these uh, hidden staircases that take you to the second floor. Um, well, thank you so much, Bijun, and uh, please continue to create during this pandemic. Go check out that mural uh, outside of Washington Bakery. 
Another example of community helping out community. Speaking of community, I'm so honored to introduce our last storyteller of the evening and my dear friend in my own personal community, Lisa Lin. We've gone to public elementary school together, middle school, high school, and she even planned my bachelorette party. We talk about our Toysan moms uh, cooking that's similar yet slightly different takes on different classic Toysan dishes. We talk about how both our moms grow garlic and chayote or hapsao gua in their backyards. And we talk about how our moms just say the darndest things. So Lisa Lin, uh, born and raised in San Francisco, like myself, is the voice behind the website, Healthy Nibbles. She often shares cooking videos on Instagram, at Hello Lisa Lin, featuring her sassy mother, who also has an Instagram. Uh, it's at Hello Mama Lin. Uh, first I have to say, sorry, I just have so many things to say. Her mom has 10,000 followers, like more than I do. <laughs> so through Lisa's website and cooking videos, Lisa hopes to honor the food and traditions that surround her Chinese American upbringing. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for hanging around to the end for my presentation. Um, I just wanna say, I made a video, but before we put on that video, um, Biju and I really loved all the photos that you shared. So that was awesome. Um, yep, yeah, so the video explains my story. So let's just get to the video. Hi, my name is Lisa Lin and I am from San Francisco. In the late 80s, my parents and my siblings immigrated from Toisan or Huaisan, which is a rural county in Guangdong province, and they eventually settled in San Francisco. Although I am the only American born child in the family, I felt very immersed in Chinese culture growing up. I spoke Chinese with my parents and my grandmother. My mom cooked a lot of classic Toysan dishes and I spent so much of my formative years in Chinatown. I went to preschool in Chinatown. Every day after school, I was in Chinatown and on Saturday mornings, I was back in Chinatown again, going to Chinese school, even though I very much would have preferred staying home watching my Saturday morning cartoons. Growing up in that kind of environment where I was surrounded by people speaking in Cantonese and Taoisan and eating Chinese food all the time really helped solidify my identity as a Chinese person. So fast forward to 2014, I started a food blog called Healthy Nibbles and Bits, and I was chugging along for a little while. I was just blogging about healthy recipes, but after a few years, blogging about things like paleo chicken wings or chia pudding just wasn't really that fulfilling to me anymore. And my mom turned 70 at around that time, and I suddenly felt this urgency that I needed to learn all of her classic recipes. So her peanut candy, her legendary sponge cake, which is a favorite amongst family and friends, and a lot of the classic Toysan dishes like her peanut cake, steamed peanut cake, fa sang te. I just felt like I needed to learn how to cook these recipes to make sure the recipes survive down to the next generation. So I stuck a phone in front of my mom's face, recording her making peanut candy, and I shared it on Instagram. And I wasn't really expecting much at the beginning. I just thought maybe a few people would be entertained by watching a 70-something-year-old Chinese lady cooking. And I wasn't expecting the amount of response that my mom's cooking videos would get. I think people enjoy watching my mom's videos because they see my mom reflecting their own mothers, their parents, their grandparents, their relatives. And these videos bring on these feelings of nostalgia of foods that people grew up with. One thing that surprised me quite a bit was the amount of messages I've gotten from people specifically talking about the Cantonese and Toysan dialects that my mom uses in the videos. Mm -hmm. Now my mom in Italy. 
So my mom speaks to me in Thoisan all the time, and I don't think much of it because that's how she's communicated with me since I was a child. But I get so many messages from people telling me how they appreciate that my mom speaks Thoisan because they see themselves reflected in these videos that I share on social media. And it's very heartwarming and very fulfilling to me. And in typical Chinese mother fashion, my mom still worries about how I'm feeding myself. Even though I am 30 something years old and I cook for a living and she sees what I cook on social media, she's still worried. So every single time I visit San Francisco, she'll ask me what I want from Chinatown. She still buys dried shrimp, dried scallops, and preserved vegetables, hai toy for me, um, just to make sure that I can feed myself. I mean, where would we be without our parents and elders, right? I think cooking with my mom and filming all of these cooking videos really helped me and my mom connect together even better. It's, it's not just a matter of learning my mom's recipes, but it's also the means by which I connect with my culture. I don't live in San Francisco anymore and being able to still cook all these traditional Chinese recipes with my mom really helps me cling on to the culture that I grew up with. And I think my mom enjoys cooking with me too, because we really wouldn't be spending as much time with each other if it weren't for these cooking videos. Maybe I'm not teaching you. <laughs> She's saying mine are too big. I'm good thing. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for watching! And you can get way more, many more of those videos on Lisa's Instagram as well as Mama Lynn's Instagram. Thank you, thank you so much, Lisa. Do you want to add anything else, thank Lisa? Um, no, that's it. I mean, it's funny because like I made the video, but um, I get emotional when I see my mom because I'm like, I don't know why I'm getting emotional right now, but I'm like really proud of her. And um, yeah, I just want to like share my mom with everyone. Yeah, that's it. That's all I have to say. Shout out to Toy Sun Moms. Yes. Yeah, I know, for real. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah. Well, um, I hope you all have been uh, clicking the links, taking notes. Um, if you visit Lisa's website, um, you know, you can always go to Washington Bakery and grab your bowl of bao or trunk fun, or you can visit uh, Lisa's website to get recipes for both to make your classic toisan and Cantonese food. So, um, you know, last thing I want to say uh, before I turn it over to Twee and Kim to close is, uh, actually I have last two things to say. One is, um, uh, Chinatown is an incredibly uh, important place. It's a historic place. Um, it's a really diverse place too. I think tonight we we featured a lot of folks who are Cantonese of, uh, Toy San, from the Toisan region, from the Pearl River Delta region, but it has Fujianese people, it has Chinese Vietnamese people. Um, it's a, a cultural hub for all types of Asians and shout out to Manila Town that used to be on Kearney Street and um, the history of the Filipinos um, in the area as well. And so um, I hope you get a chance to explore the diversity of Chinatown, um, know that there's uh, something for everyone. And um, I appreciate you letting me be your guide and your MC tonight. I hope these stories inspire you to visit Chinatown, go on a walking tour, support, support a local business or art center, or find a, a recipe on uh, Lisa's website to cook with your family and friends. I know I will. So I'll turn it over to Rooted Recipes founders Twee and Klim to, to close out. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tracy. You are the best guide. I knew we did it right when we tapped you to MC this. Um, thank you so much to all of our storytellers, Vivian, Miss Dorothy, Tamiko, June May, Chelsea, Leland, Bijun, and Lisa. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to our ASL interpreters, um, Stephanie and Christine, and to our tech team, Elaine, Joe, Mayo, um, to Kim. Uh, I feel like it just am. Thank you, M, And thank you to our community partners, Shirley and YY. 
Um, this does conclude um, our main program, um, but if you would like to stick around um, to do a little reflection and talk back with us, um, you're all welcome to do so. Um, and Kim, did you want to say something? No, I think you covered it. Um, thank you again to our full team. Also, thank you to APIC once again for having us be a part of the United States of Asian America Festival. Um, APIC and the United States of Asian America Festival is actually the reason why Rooted Recipes Project came to be. Um, so we thank them so much um, for giving us this space. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, if you want to stick around, um, you're free to stick around, but we're going to just officially close off and stop the live streaming as well as the recording for folks that may want to do any private reflections with the group. Yeah, and we're going to let you take a moment to gather your thoughts um, for our um, storytellers and, and our presenters. Um, you know, I forgot to take a photo of us at the beginning, so I was wondering if maybe we could all share our video and if we could just We'll just take a quick capture um, so June May can have this on their wall. <laughs> and this also includes Stephanie and Christine, our ASL interpreters. Please stick around for a picture. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Um, okay. This Chelsea and Vivian and Shirley, do, do y'all wanna share your videos? I think we're gonna have to take two. Um, how do I do this? Kim, can you do this? Yeah, I'm able to fit everybody, I think, in one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, it. everyone smile. <laughs> smile, I'm gonna take a couple. Uh, how do, oh, you know what, I got one and I'm gonna hope I captured it because I sometimes don't know how to do these things. <laughs> Okay, I'll do I'll do one more just in case. Okay, awesome. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And I, if you all want to join us for the share back, that'd be great. You can unmute yourselves. And for our audience members, if you want to say if you want to raise your hand, um, I'll we'll we'll call on you. So oh, I'm okay. recording. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. Just Should this, I also uh, stop live streaming? Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> Let's stop the live stream.